The Mandalorians are famed as some of the fiercest fighters and most effective bounty hunters of the galaxy. These children of Mandalore have long been scattered across the stars, united only by their common creed. However, they were once a united people whose great armies led by the Mandalores brought the Republic to its knees. Today, let us explore the history of these Mandalorian Crusaders. In our digital age, we spend a lot of time online inputting information to get access to products and services, but that's a huge risk to your own personal data. And if you've seen the John Oliver special, you'll know just how vast the brokerage market is, how specific the information is that they have, and how many people are being traded this information on a daily basis. It's actually quite scary, and I know personally I've seen a huge increase in you know phishing attempts, spam calls, uh, data leaks, all kinds of stuff. It's crazy. And that's why I'm excited today to bring you our sponsor, Aura. Aura is an all-in-one internet safety tool that includes VPN, password management, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, and internet parental controls, as well as malware protection. But for me, the best feature is how Aura will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. But that's just for folks who do things legally. There's always that CD underbelly of the internet. And for that, Aura will help you detect when your information has been involved in a data breach or has been circulating across the dark web and will give you recommendations on what to do. Aura offers all these internet safety tools for a great deal. And if you sign up right now, Aura will give you a 14 day free trial by using my link, aura.com invicta, or scanning the QR code. You'll be shocked by exactly how much private information Aura finds exposed on the internet in just two weeks. So check it out. While the Mandalorians are most commonly associated with the Outer Rim, legends trace their origins back to the core world of Coruscant. It was here, more than 200,000 years ago, that several humanoid species vied for control of the planet. The two major factions were the Tong and the Thirteen Nations of the Gel, which some have identified as human ancestors. Their conflict burned for many centuries. It was during one of these climactic events that the armies of the Gel were on the brink of destroying the Tong. However, legends tell that at this very moment, a volcanic eruption devastated the attackers, wiping out their capital and shrouding the world in ash. The Tong saw this as a divine omen and, adopting the name Warriors of the Shadow, they waged a brutal counterattack against their foes. For a time, they proved victorious. Yet the Gel eventually rallied. The tides turned and the Tong were driven from the Coruscant itself. These refugees now fled into the stars, finding a new home in the Outer Rim. Located in a treacherous region of space, it proved an ideal place to recover their strength beyond the reach of hostile outsiders. Yet the planet itself posed its own risks. Though terrestrial in nature with oceans, plains, jungles and mountains, it was prone to climate extremes and featured many species of predators such as the Shriek Hawks and the gigantic Mythosaur. But the Tong were a resilient people who lived a largely nomadic life as they slowly attuned themselves to this new environment. Over thousands of years, they would eventually come to tame the planet. This era's history goes largely unrecorded, its events and characters residing in the mythical tales passed down through the generations. Key among these would be the story of a great warrior who came to be known as Mandalore I. He united the disparate clans of Tong, reforming their military and exterminating the Mythosaurs to finally establish full dominion of the planet. In honor of his achievements, the Tong would now recast themselves as the Mandoade, sons and daughters of Mandalore, while renaming the planet to Mandayame, or Home of Mandalore. In his wake, it would become custom for the leader of the Mandalorians to adopt the title of Mandalore, who functioned as both head of state and the armed forces. 
The position was traditionally symbolized by a mask, which would be passed down through generations of leaders. The role was non-hereditary, with each subsequent ruler having to rise through the meritocracy to prove to the clans that they had both the strength and the vision to claim the title. It would be under the direction of these new leaders that the Mandalorians would begin their rise to power. This was best exemplified by Mandalore the Conqueror, around the year 5000 BBY. It was under his leadership that the Mandalorian Crusaders were formally established. These emerged from the deeply martial and religious elements of Mandalorian society, through the establishment of a structured warrior ethos. Chief among these were the Rei Solnari, or Six Actions, which laid out the tenets of how to live one's life as a Mandalorian. Their goal was to prepare its adherents to follow the canons of honor as a means of worship through acts of glory and loyalty in war. These traditions produced highly motivated, skilled and self-sufficient warriors. Yet, while each excelled in individual combat, their lack of organization could hold them back when it came to large-scale warfare. But, when properly led by a strong leader, they could be wielded to deadly effect. This was the true genius of Mandalore the Conqueror, who managed to rally the Crusaders for a war among the stars. These now laid waste to neighboring planets within their system, with aspirations to bring the sword to those beyond. Around the year 4000 BBY, Mandalore the Indomitable would lead the Crusaders to new heights by carving a bloody path through the Outer Rim. This would put them on a collision course with the brewing war between the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire. For instance, when Mandalore led an invasion of the Tetan system, he would be personally confronted by Ulic Keldroma. The two fought in a climactic battle. When the Sith Lord emerged victorious, he bound Mandalore to his cause with an oath of allegiance. Thus were the Mandalorian Crusaders now given a new purpose to wage war upon the Republic and the Jedi. In this great Sith War, there will be many moments of glory to be sung in the halls of Mandalore. For instance, a surprise attack upon the Republican shipyard at Fohrost saw the Crusaders seize an entire fleet's worth of warships. With these, they invaded Coruscant itself, overwhelming the garrison and Jedi forces and exacting vengeance upon the humans which had long ago chased off their ancestors. From here, the Crusaders looted additional armories and depots before launching back into the stars to unleash ever more destruction. This campaign would eventually climax over the skies of the planet of Onderon. Despite displays of great valor and initial success, the Crusaders were eventually driven back by the defenders. In retreat, Mandalore the Indomitable would be killed. Though his vaunted mask would be recovered, he left behind a people in shambles, questioning their way of life. Had they not brought the Galactic Republic to its knees? Had they not repeatedly thrashed all other militaries in the galaxy? Where, then, were their gains? The answer could be seen in a field of scattered corpses, a dying species, and a dead Mandalore. Things needed to change. The Mandalorians needed to settle. They needed a true home. They needed an empire. Some had realized this sooner rather than later. In fact, a dissident movement had slowly been gaining traction in the last decade. They had been repelled by a leader whom they increasingly saw as illegitimate, especially after having been defeated in single combat and debasing his will to that of the Sith. They also criticized the latent disorder of the Crusaders, now pioneering new methods of discipline and structure in what would become known as the Neo-Crusader movement. For a time, they existed as a fringe group. However, change would come when Mandalore the Ultimate arose to lead his people into a new era. This new Mandalore was also a reformist at heart. 
He recognized the strength that structure provided and encouraged the movement, blending it with the traditional Mandalorian culture. At first, this was done in a limited capacity, with Neo-Crusaders being tested in the vanguard of his armies. Yet, as these met with great success, their units would be integrated across the wider armed forces and their methods applied at a large scale. Another major reform was to expand the manpower pool of the clans. No longer would the Mandalorians primarily be composed of the dwindling Tong. Now, new species were brought into the fold. But rather than dilute their ancestral ways, these recruits would be sent to newly established training complexes on harsh planets, where they could be steeped in the traditions which had long forged the Mandalorians into a formidable warrior people. With the advent of the new Mandalorian Crusader, let us now take a closer look at how each individual evolved, starting with their equipment. The earliest generations of Crusaders would not have had much of a standardized kit. As mentioned previously, they lived the life of marauding techno-barbarians. Thus, primitive Crusaders would likely have used whatever materials were readily on hand. In the early years, this meant donning equipment best attuned for life on Mandalore itself. Defensively, this meant the adoption of carapace-style armor inspired by the creatures of the planet, notably the mighty Mythosaur. Offensively, they used a variety of ranged weapons, including blaster pistols and rifles. For cultural as well as practical reasons, they also wielded melee weapons, which were variants of those the Tong had used for generations. As they began to expand, so too did their equipment. Soon, Crusaders could be seen sporting more robust armor sets, which featured a helmet, shoulder pauldrons, van braces, a breastplate, codpiece, knee pads, and thigh and shin guards. Offensively, they used an ever-expanding range of weapons based on the foes which they fought. One of the greatest enemies in this regard would be the Jedi. Over the years, the two would fight many wars, with the Mandalorians quickly adapting their arsenal to counter such agile force wielders. One approach was to keep up in terms of mobility. This might be achieved by using jetpacks to move more quickly or repulsors to create shockwaves capable of repelling enemies. Another approach was to deploy a wider range of weapons. For instance, blasters, which might have their lasers deflected, could be swapped for kinetic rounds delivered via scatter guns or slug throwers, which were harder to block. It also proved useful to use gauntlets as platforms for deploying a range of tools in the manner of a Swiss army knife. This included darts, grappling lines, blades, flamethrowers, wrist rockets, and the deadly whistling birds whose self-guided munitions could take out multiple targets at once. Much of this evolution would have been accelerated by the reforms of Mandalore the Ultimate and the Neo-Crusaders. For instance, their emphasis on organization and uniformity resulted in the standardization of armor sets. These, in turn, could be mass-produced by the new war forges, set to equip the new ranks of Mandalorians. Designs were lighter and stronger than their predecessors, with additional features such as integrated comlinks for better coordination and oxygen reserves for combat in hostile environments, including the vacuum of space. Specialized variants also existed to provide increased stealth for scout units or staying power for shock troopers. In these matters, the Mandalorian armorers were kept busy. One major innovation was the increasing adoption of Beskar. This was a precious metal, only found natively on the planet Mandalore and its moon Concordia. In its purest form, 
Beskar stands as one of the toughest metals in the galaxy, capable of withstanding blaster fire and even repelling strikes from a lightsaber. The method of forging with this legendary material was a closely guarded secret passed down through generations of Mandalorians. Skilled smiths worked it not only into pieces of armor, but also weapons such as the Beskad sword, the Municad halberd, the Kull dagger, crush gaunts, and more. But perhaps the most coveted Beskar-derived weapon would be the Darksaber. Created around 1050 BBY by Tari Vizsla, the first Mandalorian ever inducted into the Jedi Order, it would come to be an important symbol of leadership and legitimacy, which one could only attain by defeating the previous owner in combat. But how did one train to fight as a Mandalorian in the first place? As had been the case for generations, much of this was a trial by fire, with Mandalorian society functioning as a crucible which forged warriors through their customs. This is best exemplified by the Rezal Nair, the foundation for the Mandalorian way of life. It was sung to children in the cradle and recited by commandos in the dark. One could not be a Mandalorian without following the Rezal Nair. The six actions are as follows. To wear Mandalorian armor. To protect one's clan and family. To provide for the clan. To raise one's children as Mandalorians. To speak the language of the Mandalorians. And to answer the call of the Mandalore. Beyond this, Mandalorian combat training varied. In early years, it focused more on survival and raiding, with individuals naturally evolving into specializations such as medics, trackers, snipers, hackers, saboteurs, swordsmen, and commandos. In later years, however, the training camps meant to raise the newly enlisted generations of Neo-Crusaders would have provided more structured drills. This ranged from weapons handling to live fire drills, counter-terrorism exercises, and torture resistance, all with an overall focus on clan and brotherhood. This brutality was characteristic of the Mandalorian culture. While violence and pragmatism took center stage, as always, family and community made up the stage itself. So, how would these crusaders be organized for battle? Once more, a contrast should be drawn between the early and the late crusaders. The former was rather anarchic in nature, with an independent habit that could only be tamed by bonds of loyalty or the leadership of a strong ruler. Thus, one might be able to make out the basics of an organizational structure through the social hierarchy. At the top was the Mandalore, followed by the great houses and beneath them the clans. Each would have its own ever-shifting pecking order based on their tribal meritocracy. The Neo-Crusaders, meanwhile, sought to introduce a rudimentary chain of command and divisions of labor not found in traditional Mandalorian culture. Here, one could still find the Mandalore, the Great Houses, and the clans, but there would now be recognized positions ranging from the Field Marshal to the Rally Masters and the Frontline Troops. In addition, there were also more defined specialist groups, such as the Shock Troopers. It is at this point that we should also mention the droid and fleet units, which rounded out the Mandalorian armed forces. Among the smallest but most famous of these were the Basilisks. These were semi-sentient combat droids whose metal frame measured around 5 meters in length. Yet, despite their small size, they boasted an impressive arsenal of lasers, pulse wave cannons, shatter missiles, and mines. In addition, their high speed and ability to fly in and out of atmosphere made them ideal mounts for Mandalorian raiders. 
In a class above these were the Terok type gunships and the Devab type starfighter. Both were fast and nimble vessels used to swarm over targets in near planet and stellar warfare. Often these would be used to clear the way for and escort Q carrier dropships that would be used to deploy crusaders to the front lines of a fight. All of these would be transported between engagements by the frigates and carriers of the fleet. During the Crusades, these constituted the bulk of the Mandalorian Navy. However, we should still note that battleships, dreadnoughts and other capital-class ships did exist. Though limited in number, they still made their presence known thanks to their formidable arsenals and troop complements. When used judiciously and strategically, they proved able to turn the tide of many critical battles. With this understanding in mind, let us now return to the reign of Mandalore the Ultimate as he prepared to lead the Neo-Crusaders on a grand new campaign. Launched in 3976, this fresh onslaught washed over the Outer Rim territories. Early battles proved the Neo-Crusaders were capable of achieving spectacular victories, even when outnumbered many times over. For instance, the naval Battle of Althea famously saw five brutal days of fighting over the planet's outer defenses. The Mandalorian commanders attempted to break the impasse by attacking the enemy's flank and drawing them out of position with a feint. However, during this operation, an intrepid battle group under Candorus Ordo spotted an opportunity to strike directly at the enemy center. Despite being outgunned 10 to 1, this succeeded in splitting the Althiri formations and precipitated their defeat. The post-battle assessment proved that the new methods of command and control had acted as highly effective force multipliers. The Neo-Crusader movement had earned its place in Mandalorian warfare. Such glorious displays now further intensified the zeal of the Crusaders. Soon, many planets were raided and sacked. The assault upon Cathar was especially brutal, with the Mandalorians launching a surprise attack that jammed interstellar communications, knocked out planetary defenses, and exterminated the population through a combination of orbital bombardments and drone sweeps. In this way, were entire systems cowered into bending the knee. Soon, Mandalore the Ultimate had carved out a new realm for the clans whose new doctrine allowed them to grow ever more powerful with each new conquest. Behind the bleeding front lines, he made sure to consolidate his holdings by extracting resources, building up his logistics, and conscripting or enslaving many peoples. Within a decade, a vast empire had been formed with new operational bases and warforges primed to take the fight yet further into the core systems. This did not go unnoticed. The Republic was well aware of these events thanks to the waves of refugees fleeing the carnage and its own intelligence forces. For a time, either side sized the other up in a series of skirmishes along the frontier. Yet it was in these matters that the Neo-Crusaders proved their superiority. Their organized vanguard methodically probed for weaknesses, finding kinks in the Republic's armor and setting the stage for a full-scale invasion. This would come in the form of a massive multi-pronged onslaught which completely overwhelmed the Republican defenses which had not yet recovered from the Great Sith War. The savagery of Mandalore the Ultimate proved particularly effective at shattering their resistance when he showed no hesitation in deploying nuclear weaponry against any and all targets. It was in this way that he glassed the planet of Sirocco out from under its orbiting fleet. 
before turning its now isolated Republican defenders into scrap metal, which he promptly salvaged to forge new weapons of war. Time and again, the Mandalorian Armada bested its opponents, driving the dagger ever deeper towards the heart of the Republic. During this time, the Jedi High Council had forbidden its followers from involving themselves in the war. They had been deeply scarred as an institution by the horrific militarism of the Great Sith War, attempting now to walk in the ways of peace. Yet this stance would prove untenable in the face of the Mandalorian onslaught. At this time, a charismatic young Jedi later known as Revan, began assembling followers to break this interdiction and strike back. These attempted to make their way to the buckling front lines of the war front. Here, they witnessed firsthand the threat posed by the Mandalorians and visited many of the planets which had fallen victim to their atrocities. Using these reports, they were able to eventually convince the Jedi Council to make a small allowance for limited numbers of Jedi to be attached to Republican units as healers. Soon, this token force, under the brilliant command of Revan, proved capable of standing up to the Mandalorians in a series of minor conflicts. This in turn led to an expansion of their duties and Revan's rapid promotion. For instance, when the planet of Duro had fallen to the Mandalorian assault force, he was able to rally a fleet of Interdictor-class cruisers to prevent the raiders from making off with large amounts of war material from the shipyards. Soon after, Revan was named Supreme Commander, with direct control over a third of the Republic's forces. From this position, he was able to halt the Mandalorian tide. But in order to begin pushing them back, Revan knew that he had to leverage the superior industrial might of the Republic. Thus, he came to adopt a mentality of attrition where victory would slowly be gained through the sacrifice of manpower, resources, and territory. For instance, when the Mandalorians managed to wipe out an entire Republican fleet group at the Battle of Jaeger's Cluster, Revan would respond by ordering hundreds of small unit attacks along the warfront while leading two major attacks upon key Mandalorian strongholds. The campaign lasted months and saw an estimated 10 Republican soldiers die for every one Mandalorian. In theory, these were the numbers of a defeat, but in practice, the pressure generated by these actions stretched their foes to the breaking point. It was this fact which allowed Revan to isolate and destroy a large Mandalorian ground army on Althea. This was a huge blow to the price of Mandalore the Ultimate, who now sought to exact revenge. But this was the exact response the Jedi had counted on. A trap was set in the Malachor system. Here, Revan increasingly influenced by the dark side, laid a trap by offering half of his fleet as bait. The Mandalorians, seeing this apparent error and desperate for a victory, pounced on the seemingly vulnerable fleet. But soon after the battle was joined, Revan and his reinforcements arrived, trapping the Mandalorian fleet and engaging in what was a clearly decisive battle. Sensing his doom, Mandalore made a desperate gambit. He challenged Revan to single combat. The Jedi accepted without hesitation. Their duel on the Mandalorian flagship was hard fought, but ultimately ended with a victorious Revan. Yet, even still, the demoralized Mandalorians fought on. As the Republican fleet closed in on their planet, the casualties mounted on both sides. It was at this moment that Revan sprung his final trap. He now ordered his lieutenant to activate a secret superweapon, 
the mass shadow generator. Instantly, a massive gravitational vortex was formed. The vast majority of ships, both Republic and Mandalorian, were instantly annihilated, as was the planet itself. In the wake of this cataclysm, the surviving Mandalorians surrendered unconditionally. And so, the Mandalorian Wars ended. In the weeks that followed, Revan ordered the remaining Mandalorians to be stripped of their weapons and armor, while their fleets of droids and warships were to be dismantled. This was a crippling blow to the Crusaders. However, Revan knew that it was not a mortal one, as they could very well rally behind the next great Mandalore who rose to lead them. Thus it was that he sought to slay the Hydra before it could grow a new head by refusing to return the hallowed Mask of Mandalore to its people. His plan was well-founded. In the years that followed, the Mandalorian clans would be left fractured, drifting aimlessly from conquering Crusader to a new era of the mercenaries and bounty hunters. But their story will have to wait for another time. I hope you found this topic both entertaining and enlightening. What units of Star Wars should we cover next? For now, be sure to head on over to our Patreon to catch script previews, participate in polls, and grab HD downloads of our art. A big thanks to the current patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. If you liked this content, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of our videos. See you in the next one.